What am I missing here? Is this Molesoft or is it late night lo-fi? I can't tell. I'm trying to reconnect with my son, but all he cares about is aesthetics. Have you, or a loved one, ever found yourselves in one of these scenarios? My name's Pinkas, and I'm here to help. It is my belief that every man, woman and child should have the opportunity to understand and appreciate great art. This great education system of ours has failed when it comes to the teachings of Vaporwave, and I'm here to make things comprehensible for you. I've taken an online course and watched over three videos on the subject, so let me help me help you. Call the number on the screen and plan an appointment with my secretary. And remember, better sub to Pinkas. The vaporwave subgenres have become so numerous and distinct that it's close to a joke at this point. However, I will try my best to differentiate the biggest ones and provide some examples for each genre. I just want to start off by saying that I'm not very knowledgeable about music theory or any type of actual musical history, but I know how to google and you guys have been asking, so let me provide. I'm also of course gonna include some notes about the aesthetics for each genre as that is more of my expertise, uh, what, what I'm known for at least. First, let's start off with what's not Vaporwave. Often associated with Vaporwave because of its similarity, but being its entirely own unique genre, we have Synthwave. Mainly influenced by French house and synth heavy movie soundtracks from the 80s by artists like Vangelis and John Carpenter. Synthwave was born around the mid 2000s by artists like Kavinsky, College and Justice. While others had dabbled with similar styles before, it's these artists that introduced the pure Synthwave style that we think of today. It became popular around the same time as Vaporwave, greatly contributing to the confusion between the genres. Synthwave started reaching the mainstream after the release of the movie Drive that had a soundtrack which consisted of Synthwave music. Most famously, Night Call by Kavinsky and A Real Hero by Electric Youth and College. The music feels more like pop than Vaporwave. It's less reliable on samples and more minimalistic in terms of effects and processing. It also consists of original compositions and tend to have a faster tempo than Vaporwave, along with a more high fidelity sound than Vaporwave's lo-fi aesthetic. And of course, the music is mostly based around hard-hitting 80s synths. I've already gone into depths about the Outrun aesthetic, which is the equivalent of Synthwave. I did that in my video called Vaporwave vs Outrun. But if for some unexplainable reason you haven't seen that yet, just uh, think of retro sports cars, long dark grids, wireframe mountains, and a bright orange slash yellow sun. If you have ever ventured into the depths of YouTube recommendations after listening to some Vapor Wave or Future Funk, you've probably come across Maria Takushi's Plastic Love. This song almost single-handedly revived the genre that is city pop. Japanese pop music from the late 70s and 80s, inspired by American pop music and genres like R&B, funk and soft rock. City pop came out of the boom that was the Japanese economy during the 80s, years that were defined by optimism and positivity towards the future. The genre is more defined by which feelings it evokes, rather than strict genre rules. Mellow and calming tones sounding similar to music or background music, transporting us to an entertaining night out in a city where fancy restaurants and clubs were the destination for the evening. City Pop's name comes from the lyrics often referencing an urban lifestyle, along with the artwork that often also appreciated this rich and prosperous daily life of the new capitalistic Japan. The aesthetics used in City Pop are defined by a chill, calming vibe, summery feel, and the urban lifestyle. Some of the most influential artists contributing to the City Pop aesthetic are Hiroshi Nagai and Aisin Suzuki, Japanese illustrators creating album covers for some of the biggest City Pop labels in Japan. Summary artwork inspired by California and the West Coast, palm trees, American cars, and all around chill vibes. These have been reused and repurposed in recent years for the Vaporwave and Future Funk aesthetic, respectively. Future Funk producers also have a habit of sampling city pop songs and artists.
which can explain why people tend to associate City Pop with Vaporwave. Now that that's out of the way, let's get back to what this video is really about. Vaporwave. The origins of Vaporwave can almost be traced back to one single person, and that person is Daniel Lopatin, aka 103.never, aka Sunset Corp, aka Chuck Pearson, aka Chuck the Duck. <laughs> okay, okay, I made that last one up. Lapatin, a big fan of Plunder Phonics, started this Vaporwave venture by releasing music clips onto YouTube under the pseudonym Sunset Corp back in 2009. Not long after, he came out with the album Chuck Pearson's Echo Jams, Volume 1. The name and album art was inspired by the video game Echo the Dolphin, everybody's favorite dolphin. The album has been hailed as pretty much the origin point of everything we consider Vaporwave today, and while still relevant, Echo Jams now refers to a specific type of Vaporwave music that try to capture the essence of this groundbreaking album. Chopped up distorted pop samples being repeated sometimes throughout the entire song. Rather than smooth transitions between different samples and rhythms, echo jams often use hard cuts. While subgenres like future funk tends to speed up an old Japanese pop song and stay with that speed for the rest of the song, echo jams will mainly slow down the song, but also change the speed of the song multiple times during playback, making it sound heavily eerie and distorted. Some other notable effects in the genre are heavy use of reverb, glitching, echo and distortion. The aesthetics of Echo Jams are mostly defined by the projects of Daniel Lapatin, the Chuck Pearson Echo Jams release and the Sunset Corp music videos. The Echo Jams album has some pretty distinct visuals featuring distorted graphics that has been put together to look like the cover of Echo the Dolphin for Sega CD. Media Fired, one prevalent Echo Jams producer, also has a profile pic on Discogs that suggests an underwater video game influence. Could this also be a place where Seapunk and Vaporwave crossed over for the first time? We know that Echo Jams was released around one year before the tweet that launched Seapunk was ever made. So maybe Vaporwave or Echo Jams, as it was called during the time, actually played a part in the creation of Seapunk. That question is gonna become too much to handle in this video, so let's get back to Sunset Corp. The videos released on this YouTube channel mostly consists of video clips taken from old 80s and 90s commercials and then adding heavy glitch and distort effects to them, as well as looping it. Almost like if you were playing it back on that VHS cassette that your little sister spilled milk and cereal all over before throwing it out the window. And then you had to go out and look for it because you'd do anything to see this sexy boy again. Lapidin refers to the theme of these videos as bizarre science fiction, which can be contributed to the Echo Gems genre as a whole. Among those who've strayed the furthest away from the light of Vaporwave, we have Vapor Trap. Having its roots in trap and hip-hop music, this specific style started emerging from the Vaporwave umbrella mainly because of one artist, Blank Banshee. The genre was established when Blank Banshee released the album Blank Banshee Zero in 2012. While perhaps one of the genres that sounds the least like traditional Vaporwave, it still has some rather Vaporwave-y characteristics. The sample usage is very similar to what we're used to from Vaporwave. Slowing down and pitch shifting startup sounds from a Macintosh, retro video game sound effects and popular culture, but adding those hard hitting trap beats. While some parts of the Blank Banshee album can be hard to argue as fitting inside the term Vaporwave, there's definitely Vaporwave themes throughout. Also, there's the album cover. The face of Lara Croft on top of a neon colored gradient. Imagery that feels right at home with established Vaporwave artwork. The aesthetics tend to be closely associated to this Blank Banshee release. Early computer graphics along with some retro computer symbols or shortcuts, especially from old Microsoft OS or just computers themselves. Some glitch effects are also highly encouraged along with rather mismatching imagery combining this digital world with the real world, similar to the jokey genre of vapor meme, where you just slap anything closely related to Greek statues and pastel colors and make some artwork out of it. Blank Banshee started off in the band Shinjuku Mad, I hope I said that right. His role was producing and mixing while his friend Curtis Ferguson did the vocals and songwriting. Among the songs the duo released, we have this song called Resistor. that Blank Banshee would later remix and release as the now legendary song, Dreamcast. 
At the spot for the most party friendly of the subgenres, we have Future Funk. Generally consisting of sped up disco and pop songs from the 80s and early 90s, with heavy ties to Japanese city pop music and anime. Originally inspired by European house music acts such as Daft Punk's Discovery album, songs consisting of a high tempo at around 128 bpm, featuring fat disco bass lines together with chopped up looped samples from the chorus of a song, creating an almost euphoric feeling where only the best part of the song gets played over and over again. The samples usually originate from Japanese city pop or western disco from the 80s. The popularity of Future Funk has also brought some hate towards the genre. It's commonly referred to as easy to make, being lowbrow and lacking depth. A fair point, I, I, I agree, but it's my interpretation that Future Funk has a strong bond to aestheticism itself. Whereas aestheticism is the appreciation of art for art's sake where it doesn't need to serve a political, moral or other purpose, Future Funk does the same with audio. It doesn't try to tell you some political message about capitalism or communism. It isn't there to give you a deeper meaning of life or really any substance. It's joy in its purest form. It's music meant to be enjoyed and only that. It takes you to a state of bliss and keeps you there, with your anime girlfriend and all of Jackson 5 cheering you on while you rock the dance floor. The Future Funk aesthetic is mostly inspired by anime and some disco. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that this anime aesthetic was mostly headlined by Macross 8299 and Young Bay, both using anime straight out of the gate. Macross being the first with his 2013 album Sailor Wave, taking artwork from the anime Sailor Moon and Young Bay coming a year later with Bay. A lot of the albums these guys made set the standard for what Future Funk would eventually look like in the future. Music videos usually consists of a repeated gif from a classic anime show, a girl dancing or a glimpse into a big city. Utopian Virtual sounds like the background music you would hear while playing through SimCity 3000. It all started with James Ferraro's Farside Virtual, an early Vaporwave release that was inspired by simulation video games like Second Life and SimCity, along with the capitalist world of Starbucks, Apple and New York City. A very clean sound consisting of simple piano arpeggios and samples taken from computer software and games during the late 90s and early 2000s. It embodies the retro-futuristic fantasy utopia we've seen in these games. It has a rather positive and calming vibe to it, sounding too good to be true, yet remains emotionless and distant with the corporate aesthetic. Jens Ferraro is quoted as saying that the album Farside Virtual was inspired by ringtones and that the songs were supposed to be released as them as well. They never were, but we can hear the influence of old pylophonic ringtones. The aesthetics of this genre tends to be focused around early 3D graphics and imagery that looks too plasticky and clean to be realistic. While in 3D software today we have detailed roughness, displacement and normal maps to help us get those realistic creases and imperfections on our models and graphics, the art from Utopian Virtual is clearly inspired by the age where that wasn't the standard. Graphic that looks so clean that it doesn't appear real, belonging more in the computer simulation. Typical themes in the artwork are luxury, big city lifestyle, penthouse apartments and palm trees. If you have ever found yourself in a dreamlike state inside an empty 90s futuristic shopping mall, then the music you would hear from the speakers would probably be mall soft. Jazzy chill lounge vibes based on music, aka background or elevator music. It shares some similarities with uh, Utopian Virtual as they both have that background music feel to them as well as taking place in a hyper-capitalist dream world. Maltsoft typically consists of looping tracks that doesn't really go anywhere but keeping us in a hypnotized and relaxed state. It's music that's played for us but not actively listened to. The music is often processed so it sounds like it's coming from distant and blown out speakers. The visuals consist of what you would have guessed, empty retro shopping malls, both 3D renders and real life pictures. The malls themselves seem to have a lot of green plants within them, palm trees are especially prevalent, 
The images of said malls usually have a distorted filter on top of them or two. Glitchy text is also encouraged. Some pink purple colors tend to occur but are not required. The same goes for neon lights and Japanese text. Not to be confused with late night lo-fi hip-hop, which is what you would find if you search for this on YouTube or most other places on the internet, late night lo-fi is a subgenre of vaporwave that takes samples from the 80s pop and jazz music and turns the lo-fi dial up a couple of notches as well as slowing things down. Especially on something like Midnight Television's self-titled album, you can really feel the low quality audio. Like if the album was playing through an old CRT TV and then re-recorded from that TV and put onto a cassette. It feels like something you would see on your parents' TV in between the commercials and late night programming. A test card of sorts, or the teaser for what's coming on later tonight, but in a distorted way. The aesthetic is mostly based on these old CRT TV images, low quality imagery in a 4-3 format, probably inspired by the Echo Jams aesthetic made by Daniel Lopatin on the Sunset Corp YouTube channel. His videos for the songs End of Life Entertainment Scenario 1 and Nobody Here are the perfect examples of this low quality style. The colors tend to be washed out into a dark smudge of colors because of the heavy filtering and low quality images. Some VCR text on top of the screen is also pretty common, Replicating old teletext is also a standard thing to do within this aesthetic style, along with the TV schedule screens. In general, there's a theme of staring at a TV with nothing on it, and embracing that feeling. Weird Jazz Pop is closely related to late night lo-fi, but with a more positive and upbeat tempo. That's about it. Lo-fi Jesse 80s tracks that are a bit richer in sound than the darker, more distorted late night lo-fi. The sound isn't quite as blown out as its late night counterpart. Instead of something that would have come out of a broken old TV with a bad signal, we get a slightly more clean and crisp sound. This genre is the closest the vaporwave gets to synthwave in any way, shape, or form, but compared to synthwave, VHS pop is still a bit slower and lacks those crystal clear synth chords that we associate with synthwave. The perfect example of VHS pop is the album Palm Haze by Miami Vice. One of the more colorful aesthetics, vibrant and full of life, just like the music. Pink is of course a color that tends to repeat itself along with the bright blue that we've seen so many times before. The cover for Palm Haze by Miami Vice is perhaps the most influential and most known from the genre. It closely resembles the cover of Hayahu Yamaneko Rest in Paradise, probably being taken from the same source footage. Colorful, dreamy and retro are the keywords to VHS pop visuals. It's hard to defend faux oh. utopian as a separate subgenre, and I'm not really gonna make an attempt on arguing for its existence. The definition in the image that I'm constructing this video around states that faux utopian takes the utopian virtual style and turns it on its head, presenting a much darker and more surrealistic vision of a future that never was. The music takes elements of utopian virtual, sometimes with echo jams techniques, and presents it with a darker twist. Now, Echo Virtual's album Atmospheres definitely have some tracks with those darker sounds on it, compared to what you would normally associate with an Utopian Virtual album. Placing Macintosh Plus's Floral Shop under this label also works, at least some of the songs where there's crossover between Echo Jams and Utopian Virtual do sound a bit unsettling. It's easy to make some similarities to dark cyberpunk future when listening to faux Utopian music, whereas Utopian Virtual sells us this Utopian fantasy, Faux Utopian tries to sell it, but glitches halfway there and shows us for a few moments that everything is not what it seems. That's basically how I would sum up Faux Utopian, very similar to Utopian Virtual, but a bit more unsettling and some echo jams sprinkled in. Faux Utopian doesn't have a very distinct aesthetic, it's mainly influenced by surreal commercial and corporate imagery. It should be mentioned that Macintosh Plus's Floral Shop was the first album to introduce the Greek statue as part of vaporwave art, something that will be carried over to almost all the other vaporwave subgenres and vaporwave as a whole, due to the extreme popularity of the song Lisa Frank 420 slash Modern Computing. The song had over 40 million views on YouTube before being taken down by Sony. The most popular version still up today sits at around 8 million views, making it a first impression of Vaporwave for a lot of people. 
Before we had the vaporwave, there was something called the hypnagogic pop. Hypnagogic pop is a broad term for a genre of music that's psychedelic in nature, which draws heavily from lo-fi analog technology and nostalgic 80s and 90s popular culture. Now you might say, hey, hey, that sounds a lot like the description of vaporwave. Well, you are correct. Hypnagogic pop can be considered as a parent genre of vaporwave. Both James Ferraro and Danny Lopatin are considered pioneers of the hypnagogic pop genre, and it is what a majority of their music was defined as before we got the label Vaporwave to put this type of music in. Now, hypnagogic drift is a version of this type of music with a more ambient drifting feeling and using the sampling techniques we normally associate with the Vaporwave. Hypnagogic drift transports you through a dreamlike state and space. It's one of the earliest forms of Vaporwave through the albums Holograms and the self-titled Skeleton by Skeleton. I'm not 100% sure if his name is actually Skeleton, there's just some Asian signs here, so you know, I just Google translate it, so yeah, if you know, please help me out. Albums and imagery tend to be rather surreal and dreamlike. Very low quality covers, similar to Echo Jams, but without the C and video game themes. Because of the influence of Skeleton's Telepath and Hong Kong Express, this genre's aesthetic is defined by a heavy Asian influence, as all aforementioned artists use mostly Asian titles and imagery on their albums. That's the video, my dudes. I've included some links in the description with my sources and also a Spotify playlist for each genre that you should really check out. I know there are more vaporwave subgenres out there like broken transmission and signal noise. It's just that the video would be way too long and I've already wasted enough time on, on making it. But uh, who knows, maybe I'll make a part 2 one day. I didn't make this video to narrow the field of what Vaporwave is, or what type of art you can make, but rather help you if you really like that SimCity Vaporwave music but never knew where to find more of it, or you loved the late night lo-fi aesthetic but didn't know what it was called. I hope this has been somewhat educating and entertaining and I would really appreciate it if you left a like on the video. I mean, you don't have to if you feel like the video was garbage, but uh, you know, it helps the channel out, it helps me out, and it makes me feel like I didn't just waste 200 hours on making this long ass video. Alright, thanks for watching, that's all for now, and uh, stay tuned for more vapor goodness.